One moment. Sorry, technical difficulty. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, we are off to a good start. Uh, I have my pants on. Um, and for some, for some context on that, uh, I'm the, I'm the fill-in. Uh, a guy called Anthony was meant to be teaching tonight. Uh, and, and James called me and he's like, hey, uh, would you speak at Regen? And I was like, I'll get back to you. Um, and then he, I didn't get back to him. Uh, so I'll admit, at the start, I'm a liar. Uh, and so this message I will bring to you is, is for myself too. Uh, that, and he came back to me, and so I, I prayed about it. I, I, I uh, talked to my wife about it. Uh, and then eventually I finally said yes. Uh, and then that night, uh, I'm not even lying, I, I was in bed, uh, and all I could think about was what I had got myself into. Uh, and, and what kept flashing before my eyes was standing in front of everyone uh, with, a pot, with a Bible and no pants. Uh, and so that's why we're off to a good start. Uh, these aren't make-believe, these are real way. Uh, good, all right, so uh, my name's Toby. Uh, I used to work here. Uh, I don't anymore, uh, but I'm back. Is that enough about me? Uh, I, ha I have a wife. Um, we have four kids. Uh, when, I, when we had our first child, uh, we would go to the scans. I would put on pants like these and I'd call them my adult pants. Uh, and so I think I am dressed like an adult tonight. Uh, and we are, are doing good. Um, but I'm, way, I'm off track already, so let me, let me see where I'm going. Oh, uh, I want to say thank you uh, to Tocha Springs. Uh, and I think you guys should too. It, it's, the, the region is, is choice, isn't it? Yeah. Where we get to come and just hang out, fellowship together, a whole bunch of different churches. I don't even know uh, how many churches are represented here at the moment. You may not even be from a church. Uh, but Tocha Springs takes the time to invite people who love the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to proclaim him to us. Uh, and we get to listen and worship by sitting under the Word of God. And so I want to say thank you to Tocha Springs that they still endeavour to do that. I want to thank, you, thank all the staff that have uh, put time in. Uh, and particularly I want to thank James uh, for heading it up. So uh, a thank you to them. Uh, join me in prayer as we begin. Lord God, we uh, are just so grateful to be here, as we've said. We thank you for your people that have put this on. We thank you for this opportunity to come and open your word together. We pray that you would speak through it, uh, that your Holy Spirit would carry these words in the, into the hearts of the hearers, and that we would uh, be receptive responders to what. Lord, we pray that you would save sinners and that you would sanctify saints. Lord, we ask this, that Jesus Christ may be glorified through us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Billions upon billions of stars are in the sky. I don't know if you, if, if you realize this, but if you look up at Tocha Springs, you see a lot of stars. It's, uh, my wife commented on it the, the first night. Uh, when we moved away from here, we didn't realize we were moving away from stars. Uh, but when you're here, you see stars so evidently uh, at night time, just so we're clear. You see stars at night time, and you see them... You, you see them vividly clear. And in the Psalms we see, if you, t if you want to begin, uh, in Psalm 8 verse 3, we read, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. This God that we've been talking about, this, uh, this conference, is the one that has created all these stars. And there are billions upon billions of stars. Our galaxy, the, the Milky Way, is thought to contain 400 billion stars. Now, if you were to count all the stars in our own galaxy, uh, if you were to count two at a time every second, uh, it's not hard maths, it would take you... 200, uh, 2 billion, oh man, I've already failed. It's, it's not, I just said it's not hard maths. Uh, you, it would take you 200 billion seconds to count all the stars in our own galaxy. 
Uh, the, the seconds, eh? That doesn't, that doesn't sound that impressive. Uh, but if the, all these seconds adds up, if you were to put that into a, a time that we understand, that would take you 6,337 years, 225 days, 13 hours, 33 minutes, and 20 seconds to count every star. Uh, that's counting two stars uh, a second, continuously, without sleep, for nearly six and a half thousand years. Uh, and that's just in our galaxy. That's a pretty impressive Milky, but Milky Way, uh, don't, don't you think? <laughs> um, but that's only our galaxy. Let's, let's up the ante. Uh, Tony talked about a, a supercomputer this morning. So let's say we have a supercomputer. Um, I forget what it was called, uh, but it's doing its teraflops. Uh, and it's, it's able to count 10 million stars a second. If it was to count all the stars in the galaxy that are estimated to be there, it would only take 63 million years counting 10 million stars every second takes 63 million years is what it's estimated. I want you to, I want that to, to sink in for you because we just read, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, our God is the one who created them. We say things like, oh yeah, I know that God is big. But do we really understand what we mean when we say big? He is like, we, we, the stars are big. I can't even stretch my hands big enough to kind of give the idea of how big our God is. We, we fail to understand our God and how vast and how immense he is. This creation of God is big, but the creator is bigger we wouldn't even register as a speck of dust in comparison to him, if you think about it. Yet tonight I've been given the task of, of asking and, and trying to answer the question, how does God, this God that created everything, how does he respond to us? How does this big God respond to little man? Why is that? Why do we even assume that God thinks about us? Why do we think that he cares about us? That he interacts with us? Why do we think this big God thinks about little us? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, many of you have sung why we assume that he thinks about it. Uh, and the words are because the Bible tells us so. Because of the Bible, God's word tells us that he does. God tells us that he thinks about us, that he cares for us, that he interacts with us, and so much more. In fact, the most, the, the, the most known verse in all of the Bible tells us much more than just that he thinks about us. Uh, turn there with me, if you will. We're going to, I'm sure you've already guessed, but John 3, 16, as we answer our question tonight, how does God respond to us? Uh, as, you're, as you turn there, I just want to let you know on a little secret. Uh, I don't like the word respond, uh, but it's, it's what I was given to work with. Uh, and, and so we'll use it, and, I, and I'll touch on why I don't particularly like it at the end. Uh, but we're going to John 3.16. We'll be going to a lot of verses. We're not going to be hunkering down in one. Um, so I want you to keep your fingers nimble and your minds focused. Uh, we, want to, we want to do a bit of a Bible study together. Because the Bible has a lot to say about this question that we're asking. So John 3.16 says... I probably don't even need to read it. You already, most of you already know it, hey? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Not only does God think of us, not only does God uh, interact with us, 
that God loves us. It's, it's what the Bible says. It's what we sing as a child. It's what we have just been singing about now together. The creator of all this bigness loves his creation, loves his people. Tony read a uh, beautiful psalm th this morning, and I think we should turn back to it. Psalm 139, uh, verse 17 to 18. Uh, I'm just getting you guys to work out your thumbs. I know you've been sitting down a lot of the day, and so if we just flick between the, the Psalms, uh, the, 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 the Bible, uh, that'll be your cardio for the day. Uh, so Psalm 139. You've already been there this morning, uh, so you know where it is. 139 verse 17 to 18 reads, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. We've just uh, read that God created billions upon billions of stars. And on one planet, there are some people, and we've read that he so loved them. This should blow our minds. But we, God's creation... Um, are loved by him and, and, and it doesn't we, we forget that I know as a, as a child I would used to uh, make some epic Lego creations uh, has anyone else done that? Uh, you know Lego you like put them together you make cool things maybe you don't make cool things but I did uh, I made some epic Lego creations and I would love what I had done but I wouldn't actually love the creations themselves that I had made. If they got vacuumed up accidentally by my mum, uh, it was my bad because she told me to clean it up in the first place, but I didn't. Uh, if, they, if they got vacuumed up or something, I wouldn't go and like search through the trash necessarily to like dish them out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about them. I wouldn't care for them. I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't love them. That just seems like the thought didn't even cross my mind. But we, as God's epic creation, are not only on our Creator's mind, but we're in His heart. We're loved by Him. And I think sometimes the familiarity with uh, this, this verse that we're just told over and over and over again, it just causes it to remain cold. We, we know it in our heads, but sometimes it doesn't come into our hearts. It's a... It's, it just doesn't become a reality. It's, it's like a textbook that we, we, we go to on Sunday. We do the lesson, and then we don't put it into practice. But God loves you. Do you realize that? These words should stir your heart. They should motivate, motivate your whole entire life. They should transform you from the inside out. But if we're honest, they don't always, do they? We, we say they do, and then we act like they don't. The best way to, to, to fix this problem, to be transformed by the love of God, I think is to, to speak specifically about it. We don't want to be general or vague. We want to be specific. Therefore, we need to carefully contemplate and consider this love of God. And from the outset, we must distinguish that the Bible teaches us that God has different types of love. We'll touch on these as we go along, um, and, uh, but I think you guys kind of already get the concept. I love KFC. And I love my wife. But I hope she knows that the love is different. Um, that my, my love for my wife far exceeds my love for Wicked Wings. Um, and I hope you guys can tell the difference. Uh, I, I, I do. But what, we, what I'm trying to get at is that God has a, a general love for the world. He loves all of his creation. And he also has a specific love for his people. I think that's important to distinguish. And, and as we consider the applications and implications of this for our life, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But for now, I want you to think about God's love for you individually. 
Because if what we've learnt about ourselves is true, recall back to the first message, that we are sinful, and if what we've learnt about God is true, which was the second message, that He knows all things, then He knows our smallness, He knows our sinfulness, He knows our ugliness, He knows. So what the heck is he doing loving us? Does that conjure up a problem in your mind? We, doesn't it make you see that we have a problem? The Bible thinks we do. And I want to get your fingers going again, so I want you to turn to a few passages with me to see this great dilemma of ours. Go back near to the beginning, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. This is such a great uh, passage of God just declaring who he is. Exodus 34 verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions and sin, and you're thinking, there's no problem, he's a forgiving God. But this, uh, it, it carries on. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. There's a, there's a problem, we're all guilty. And God won't leave us unpunished, it says. If you flick back a few, a few chapters, Exodus 23, the end of verse 7 says, um, I will not acquit the guilty. That means he won't free the guilty. Criminals will be punished is what he's saying. If you turn over to Job, even Job knew of this problem. He says in 10 verse 14, If I sin, if I sin then you would take note of me and would not acquit me of my guilt. Nahum 1 verse 3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. I think you're getting the idea, and I'll try to paint the problem for you. It's as if God shouldn't love you. That's the problem. You and I we do not deserve the love of God, but we act like we do. But the Bible says that we don't deserve it. The Bible says we deserve punishment. Yet we've just read and we've just sung that he does love us. He does love us. We know he does because of John 3.16. It comes straight to our minds. We know he does because we sing those songs. We know he does because the Bible says he does. And this is where God's love is so, so amazing. Because we see his love acting to solve this problem of ours. God's love is not, oh, I really like them. I really love them. I'll just, that sin, that problem, I'll just sweep it under the carpet. Um, that's not how he loves us. His, his love for us is so much greater. Flick back to the New Testament with me. Romans chapter 5. And uh, I just want to say this is an encouragement to hear pages turning. Uh, it's good. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would, ha would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the great, awesome love that God has demonstrated to sinful mankind. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But if you ask questions, surely you ask the question, how does that actually help? How is someone dying helpful? 
Uh, last week, I w- or it was the last week, the other week, uh, I was at Origin, um, and there's a whole bunch of youth running around, and so this, this kid lined up for some food. I was accidentally standing there, uh, and I was like, oh, sorry, are you lining up for food? And he's like, yes, obviously. And I was like, I'm not. This is how awkward I can be. Um, <laughs> and, and so I was like, but can I give you some spiritual food? And, uh, and yeah, I know. That, like, that's why I got married so young. Like, those lines just flow out of me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he was caught off guard, so like, what is he going to do? Say no? He, he said yes. And so I, uh, I said, we've just been in the, in the message where the guy's been proclaiming to us the gospel. He's, he's talked about Jesus and he talked about how he died. And I said, how does Jesus dying on the cross help you? And he said, well, well he, he's God. I said, okay, how does a God man dying on the cross help you? And then I was a little bit cheeky. I was like, normally people dying is not helpful unless you're wanting their job. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, he didn't give me such a good response. Um, he, he still didn't answer the question. He's like, uh, uh, you are not, not sure. Uh, he professed to be a Christian. He, he seemed, uh, I think from what I gathered, he, he grew up in a Christian family, went to church every week. Uh, he seemed pretty involved with, with his church. He wasn't like some guy that... that shouldn't have known the answer. He was probably a guy that should know the answer, is what I'm trying to get at. But he couldn't answer the question, how does Jesus dying on the cross help any of us? And I wonder, do you you think about that? Because I think it's a good question for you to ponder. Someone dying on 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 a cross is not generally a good thing. Have you thought about that? It, It seems weird. And uh, if you want to go and share this message with the world, you should realize that this message is going to seem weird. Uh, But thankfully, we're not left to to guess the answer. Uh, We don't make it up out of thin air. Uh, We don't try to put some Christian jargon on it to, to make people think we're smart when we're actually just hiding it. The Bible gives us the answer. Another passage answers this question for us with one word. How kind of God, eh, just to give us one word. It's like, hey, this big kind of question, one word. So jump forward in your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 4. And now that I've told you it's one word, when I go to pronounce it, I'll probably stuff it up. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9, and we'll read verse 10 as well. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Did you catch it? I didn't stuff it up, I don't think. Uh, So I didn't give you that hint, sorry. The answer to our great problem that we've been discussing is is a great display of God's love. And it comes to us in just one word. Did you catch the word? You are allowed to say yes. Yes. Or no, you're allowed to say no as well. I don't only expect correct answers. Uh, The word is propitiation. In your translation, you might have something different. You might have something like atoning sacrifice uh, or sacrifice to take away our sins. Uh, and they're all good. The I- they're all conveying the same idea. That the, I- the, idea is that um, the idea that is being conveyed is that Jesus on the cross accomplished something. He didn't just die on the cross and that was like a good lesson for us. He did something specific on the cross. It's not just a good example. It's so much more than that. It accomplished our sins being atoned for. Our sins being paid for. The price of our sins has been paid. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. 
You re recall when you go through Romans, Romans uh, 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. You, you know that, eh? people walk you through that. And you're like, oh, okay, so a wage is something that you're given because, from your work that you do, something that you earn. Uh, and the Bible tells us that our life, the wage that we deserve for our life is death. This wage is what is being paid on Jesus on the cross. What we deserve, he, he is taking on the cross. <clears throat> Instead of it being paid to us, it was paid to Jesus Christ. The sinless Savior who didn't deserve it or earn it, or um, yeah, just, he didn't deserve our sin, our, our wages, but he accepted it in our place. Propitiation. When Christ was on the cross, he was satisfying the wrath of God that you and I and all of us deserve. The wrath of God that should be poured out upon sinners was instead poured, poured out upon the sinless Savior, Jesus Christ. We call Jesus the Lamb. And this is one thing the guy at, at Origin was able to say. He was like, ah... Uh, when I asked him that question, he was like, oh, well, when Jesus died on the cross to help me, because he's like a lamb. I was like, yeah, so we have a good roast on Sunday. Um, and he's like, ah, oh, something about like Old Testament sin. Uh, we call Jesus the lamb because he was like the Old Testament lambs that were, who, who were slain for the Israelites to, to like take away their sin. Uh, and that's why he's called the Lamb. This is how God so lovingly responds to us, to those whom he saves. He dies in their place. God's love isn't just an emotion that's like, oh yeah, let's sing songs about it. God's love was shown to us in an act, a great act that we should seriously contemplate, consider, and follow after. There's a lot that could or ought to be said about this. We really should walk through from Genesis to Revelation and see how propitiation is the heart of the gospel. Uh, but this is just the introduction of, of what we're going to do. Um, we, we can really get to the, the good stuff now. Are you ready for that? This is um, by way of, of recap of, of, of the introduction to make sure that you're tracking along and following with me. We ask the question... How does the God of the Bible respond to us? Uh, the first thing I said was, I don't really like the word respond, uh, but we'll grow with it. Um, but how does God act towards us? And we see the Bible answer, John 3, 16, He so loved the world. Then we looked at how He specifically displays His love to those whom He saves. And the, the Bible answered propitiation. S say it with me, it's a cool word, propitiation. propitiation. Nice, and you're all going to go home and buy a book on that, eh? Because it, it is a good, and get Logos, um, and the, then, yeah, get it on Logos, you'll, it's good. Uh, they'll probably help you, Logos has that cool feature where you can like click on it and it tells you how it's pronounced, eh? Yeah, so that's real good, especially for the Old Testament names. Uh, Propitiation. If you, if you wanted a, a real quick way of summarizing it, 1 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way. There was 1 Corinthians 5.21, if you're taking notes. He, that's talking about God, made him, that's talking about Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The holy God who is rightfully wrathful towards sinners, dishes out his wrath upon, not on those who rightfully deserve it, us, but instead upon his own beloved son, Jesus Christ. Propitiation is the heart of the gospel. So that's, what, that's where we've been. Uh, where are we going? Why is that only the introduction? Uh, our final point, and the, the one we want to dwell on, is why. Have you thought about that? You might not have asked the question, how does someone die in hell? 
Uh, we see that it's because it's a, a, a substitutionary sacrifice. But have you ever asked the question, why does God act towards us in love? Why does God love us? Why does God love you? Why does God love anyone? We've seen there's, there's really no reason that he should. Nothing in us earns his love. No, we're, we're sinners that are just too far fallen. Even our best deeds, Isaiah tells us in uh, chapter 64, verse 6, are like filthy garments. God does not love us because we are lovable or because we deserve his love. Martin Luther said that uh, God does not love sinners because they are attractive. That's good because then I would have not been loved. Uh, but sinners are attractive to God because he loves them. So then, why does God love us? This short question is uh, one of the hardest ones I've ever grappled with. Uh, I've, I've, I tried pulling my hair out, but it, it hurt, so I stopped. Um, which is it's good advice. Uh, but have you thought about that question? Why does God love you? We know that he does, but why? As I was studying up on this, the most, com the most common answer that I heard or read was some goes something along the lines like this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, there's a phrase that says, God is love. Therefore, because God is love, he has to show his love towards people because that's just who he is. Um, and so the greatest way for him to show that he is, that God is love, is for him to love those who don't deserve it. Um, let me get, make sure I got that wrong. Uh, ma let me make sure I got that right. One, 1 John 4 verse 8 says that God is love. Therefore, because love is in God's very nature, he has to show love. He has to use this love, as it were. Because he has to show love, he then chooses to pour it out upon those who don't deserve it. To show how great his love is and how great he is. There's a problem with that. God doesn't have to do that. He's not some lonely God sitting up in heaven needing to, to pour his love out upon anyone. From all of eternity, he has had perfect love. And until eternity future, he will always have perfect love. He has already been showing and receiving perfect love forever. God has always shown love and he has always received it. Never once has this not taken place. Therefore, he doesn't need to love us. He's not required to. This doesn't answer our question why he loves us. It only attempts to tie God's hands to an action he doesn't need to take. We are yet again left with our original question. Why does God love anyone? Why does he respond to us in love? Because we know that he does love. But why? I think to understand why he loves us, we need to understand this love of God that he has been enjoying uh, for eternity. We need to understand God's intra-Trinitarian love. Uh, that's a fancy word, actually a fancy for two words uh, with a hyphen. Uh, it's just a fancy way of saying that the three persons of the Godhead, did anyone go to the, the, the Trinity talk today? Nice, there's a couple, so you guys are well prepared. Uh, the Trinity has always loved one another. Three persons, one being the Father loves the Son and the Spirit, the Son loves the Father and the, and the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son. Three persons, one being for all of eternity, been showing love to one another. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love and that's true. And they have always and will for always be showing love to one another. They don't need to pour it out upon anyone else. They each love one another. Simple. And they will always will love one another. So then why does God love us when he doesn't need to? And I was trying to come up with a really smart answer, 
just something that would just like blow your minds. Uh, and I was, I was wrestling with it for ages and I spoke to a friend and, and they're just like, you're, being, you're, you're overcomplicating it. It's because he chooses to. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been working on this for hours and you just see these few words. He chooses to. And more specifically, God loves us because of this intra-Trinitarian love. God loves us because he loves the Son. Let's go back to God's word to see this. We started in John chapter 3, verse 16, and, let's, and so let's go back to that book. Uh, there's John, if you just want to read about God's love, just read that gospel, and you will be confronted with it over and over again. But we'll jump ahead from that chapter and bypass a whole heap we could look at, um, and we just want to go to John chapter 17. Uh, while you're turning there, I uh, just want to do a shout out for Logos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, but if you're, if you're interested in this topic, because we're, we're just scratching the surface, um, but if you want to have a bit more understanding, uh, D.A. Carson has a great little book. Uh, I think it's less than 100 pages, so if you're like me, that should get your attention, because you could be like, I can read that. Uh, 100 pages or less, uh, and it's called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God, uh, and it's a great little book on this topic. Uh, John chapter 17. We'll look at verse 6 to 11. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given, that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them, I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. <coughs> and I know we're just we're jumping into the middle of a, of a portion here, but Jesus is praying to God the Father. And in this prayer, we note that God the Father has given something to God the Son. We see that believers are given to God the Son. Believers are a gift to the Son, from the Father, whom you gave me, you gave them to me, you have given me, you gave me. The reason we are loved by God is because He loves the Son. The reason we are loved by God is because He gives us as a gift to the Son. The reason we are loved by God is because He chose us as a gift. You and I are a gift to the Son who died for you and I. What a gift it is to be a gift. As I said, we've only really scratched the surface, so I encourage you to get that book or to, to dig through the, the Gospel of John. Um, I, when I elected to, to, to speak on God's love, uh, I thought it would be the easiest subject. I was like, this is a, a pretty sweet gig, you know, God's love. Um, but I've quickly found out that it's one of the hardest. It is immense, it is deep, it is vast. Um, it, it's, it's hard worked. And, and even the Apostle Paul uh, in Ephesians 3, he prays for his beloved uh, brethren in, in Ephesus. Uh, chapter 3, and you can read his prayer, uh, verses 14 to 19, I think it is. He prays for the believers there that they might know the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. This topic that we're scratching the surface of surpasses knowledge. May that too be our prayers for ourselves and for each other. We started in the heavens with the stars made by God in Psalm 8. Turn back there with me, Psalm 8, 
and see what else the, uh, the psalmist has, had to say. Psalm 8, verses 3 to 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of men that you care for him? What is man? We are a gift from, the God, uh, from God the Father to God the Son. How blessed we are to be this. How foolish we would be to not dwell on this. And to, and to contemplate how it must. It should, it, 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 we often say, this should change your life. But really, if this is true, then it must change your life. As I've just said, we, we started in the stars, but I want to finish in your hearts. How do these two truths, that God loves us, uh, he loves us, and he acts in that love with propitiation, uh, and secondly, that God loves us because of his love for the Son, how do these two truths change our hearts, and therefore change how we live today, tomorrow, and forever? I want to give you a, a few suggestions. All of us in this room, whether you say you're a Christian or not, all of us should love God because He loves you, even though you don't deserve it. You should love Him because He loves you, even though you don't deserve it. Who thought of... Uh, Who's, who's thought of like getting married one day? Nice. I mean, if you're honest, probably all of you put your hands up. Um, uh, but when you're, thinking, when you're thinking about merit, now the guys are giggling. They're like, I didn't put my hand up, but I've definitely thought about it. Um, but when you think about it, you don't think about going to get someone that, that doesn't deserve you, do you? You don't think about, oh, I'll go get someone that definitely needs work. Uh, they've got a lot of emotional baggage, a lot of scars. I'm going to go get them because I want to work on them. Uh, you kind of you, you kind of want to get someone that's like mutual, you know. Uh, but we should love God because we're that person with a lot of emotional baggage, a lot of emotional scars, and He has chosen us to set his love upon us in an immense and unfathomable way. You need to love God. You really do. So that's how it first should change your heart. Love for God. <sighs> Secondly, if, if we consider propitiation again, all of us in this room have a wage that we will be paid one day. And you have a choice to make. You can cho choose to receive the, the wage that you rightfully deserve, which is punishment, which is death from God. Or you can plead out to God the Father and ask for Jesus Christ to take that punishment for you. Have you done that? Have you truly cried out, acknowledging your sin, your guilt, that you should be in hell this very moment. But God is kind and gracious and has sustained your life. And he has allowed you to hear the gospel. And if you don't understand it, he may even now allow you to hear it tonight by asking someone. I'm sure there's many people in this room that would love to proclaim the gospel to you fully. But have you called out, cried out to the Father, be merciful to me, a sinner, and ask for Christ to be your substitute, to take the punishment that you deserve. Because you deserve it. You need to be honest with yourself. I deserve it. Have you done that? And specifically, thirdly, for, for those of you who do call yourselves Christians, this is just one thing that I was mindful of the other day, is a, a great way to share your faith is to share your testimony. Um, and if you're anything like me, you might think, oh, I have a boring testimony. I have a, I have a boring one. 
um, then you're obviously thinking too much about yourself and your testimony. Because your testimony involves God's love. So don't sell, I mean, maybe you should sell yourself short so that you can focus on God. Because he has set his love upon you. There is no boring testimony. There is only a wrong story. And it's about yourself. Focus on the God who has loved you. And now lastly, uh, I just want to just, just tie in why I don't like the word respond. All right. I know you guys have been itching to know why I don't like that word respond. And you're like, oh, that's right. He said he doesn't like respond. Uh, it's because God's love for you will never stop. Because it never started. Let that sink in. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which He is, He is an unchanging God. He is an immutable God. He doesn't change, He doesn't react. And when I hear the word respond, I think of react. God isn't a reactionary God. He is a God that has eternally acted. And so his love on us is forever secure because he doesn't start to do things because that means he would have changed. His love for us will never stop because it never started. I want you to to dwell on that and to let it infest in your heart and to just bust forth in like praise and worship of this great and kind God. God loves you. God loves his people specifically and in a specific way through Jesus Christ. Let's come to this God and and thank him for that. Almighty God, our all-loving Father, Who are we that you should love us? No act or no word, no thought of ours could cause you to love us. The only answer to your love is that you chose to love us. You chose to love us because you love the Son. We are a gift from you to him. And Lord, what will we say to you in response now? We stagger for words. We are silenced in wonder, and we are speechless with awe, Lord. But help us to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We are not worthy of this great love. Much less are we worthy of being your sons and daughters, which we see through the other passages of Scripture. to to be adopted into your very own family. Lord, how great a love you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this. I know that it's unfathomable, but help us to understand it more and more so that we can love you more and more. Lord, help us to be lovers of you because you are lovers of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.